Howdy, and welcome to my fall 20 through spring uh, 2021 orientation for the wealth, risk, and tax management uh, curricula here at Texas A&M University. I'm William Burns, and I'm the convener who organizes the faculty and curriculum, and I've been asked to share uh, because we don't have a chance to meet on campus, uh, some information about our courses, our faculty, uh, different administrators, to put a face to a name through a slide pack. Uh, also about how our learning works, by example, using case studies, uh, using team-based approach, and some other, some other interesting uh, aspects of the program. Feel free to scroll through this video. You do not need to watch the full 60 minutes. Uh, and if you're a returning student, uh, there are some new aspects, by example, connecting with your uh, uh, fellow classmates or, or other former students that uh, you can scroll directly to now. So for those of you who are new students, we start off each Texas A&M class and meeting with the Word howdy, <laughs> we shout it out loud. So you'll experience this in your, in your online Zoom live sessions with our program. I thought first I would share with you about the curriculum uh, because for the wealth, risk, and tax program, I'm often asked uh, questions about uh, which courses should or may I take? Uh, may I take courses of another curriculum if I'm in enrolled if I was admitted for a particular curriculum and so on. So let me just briefly answer. There are three, uh, if you will, curricula to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the program that you're enrolled in. Uh, if you're a lawyer, it's the Master of Laws. And if you're not a lawyer, you're a CPA or financial professional economist, you're enrolled in the uh, Master of Jurisprudence. Those curricula are based around three primary topic areas of wealth, risk, and tax risk, in particular international tax risk, but not exclusively. On the slide, as you've seen in the admissions materials, there are the courses that are offered as part of the curricula. The two courses that are required for Master of Jurisprudence students are the U.S. Introduction of Law, and secondly, the Ethics for Decision Making. The Master of Law students, having obviously already been exposed to the U.S. Law course as part of your JD education, are only required for the uh, Ethics and Decision Making course. Thus, the ethics and decision-making course, students from all three curricula will meet in that team-based approach course and uh, sit, on, sit in on problems that are current real-world problems. Right now, COVID, of course, is the uh, pandemics, is the talk of the, uh, is the, talk of the uh, town. Um, however, there are, there are many um, risk-based uh, uh, pr uh, ethics problems that, uh, that, uh, and for those of you who have sat through soft skills um, uh, training with your firms, maybe by example, you'll remember the lifeboat game. There's a lifeboat for eight people, but 12 people are on board. Uh, start making uh, uh, you know, discussions and decisions about that. It's that kind of course applied to you know, more realistic actual workplace scenarios. And now, the number one question I receive is, I've been admitted for, let's say by example, the risk uh, curriculum, but I am interested in courses in the wealth or the international tax curriculum. My general rule of thumb as your academic advisor is that you may take up to three courses of another curriculum. So by example, if you're in the risk curriculum, but as you can read on the screen, financial innovations, that's exactly what you know, the course that you wanted um, and that you need for your, for your workplace 
and you're not really interested in the other courses offered in the risk curriculum because, by example, that's what you do day to day. You've already taken those type of courses or you practice in that area. Um, you do not need my sign off uh, for that up to three courses. The, the registrar will automatically, I think, send me your, your registration for approval and, I, and I'll just automatically approve it. For students who are less experienced, you know, I strongly encourage you to take the courses within your curriculum area because those courses weren't selected and chosen by, by me. We have been, or I have in particular, been doing this program since 1994. So I have a good idea, but we hired a um, very big educational research firm to go out for each curriculum area and to uh, poll by phone calls and by uh, you know, randomized uh, choosing of different chief learning officers, um, heads of HR, uh, partners at big firms, uh, by example, accounting or law firms, uh, to poll them, to question them, what are the missing skills? What are the, what are the you know, courses that they wish they had had when they were being educated? But more relevantly, what are the courses that they wish their uh, new employees or their current employees um, had uh, to be able to better function you know, to support the firm or you know, to support their own career? These curriculum have been designed around those responses, responses uh, to hand over research as a poet. Um, and by example, for the uh, international tax polling, I think we contacted over 200 multinational companies, firms, and so forth, and, and many responses, uh, a lot of data. And then we continue to repoll um, every three years to make sure that our curriculum uh, for a particular area uh, calibrates, corresponds to what's, to what's you know, currently going on in that industry. So, the courses that you see on the screen uh, are not set in stone in terms of when they're offered. 99%, this is the offering, when they're offered and so forth. But it's up to the registrar and the dean of graduate programs to make the final, call it cuts or the final decisions. And those are published a semester ahead of time because uh, all the students need to know what they potentially can register for. And so those are published ahead of time. Um, so generally, by example, registration for spring semester is sent out in uh, early or mid-October. Um, registration for both summer and fall is generally sent out in early April. What the contents of the course, you know, what are the assignments? How much time is it going to take me? So I always say, you know, keep calm and read the syllabus. Look at your course syllabus, and those are generally published in Howdy. But well, that was last year's, or I've read the syllabus, but I'm not sure it's up to date, or I have questions about ask the course professor. So the course professor is named on Howdy, it is named in the syllabus. And uh, but okay, I'm going to cut to the chase. I'm going to go through many of our course professors, not all, but I've taken a you know a strong sampling um, to give you examples with their LinkedIn or other contact details, so you can reach out to them directly and discuss. You know, is this the best course for what I do? Or and our course professors, almost I think all of them love speaking with the graduate students. They they really. Uh, you know, they've been teaching for me, some of them, for over 20 years in this program. And, uh, and, and, and not only, you know, so do they love speaking with students, but they really have a grasp on the, you know, experienced students that we have, how this program works best with careers and so forth. So they're, you know, I, I'm, I'm obviously the, the face of the program. The convener has been doing this since 1994. Um, but I am, I am one person amongst a very strong team of, I, I'm sure, much brighter, smarter, stellar um, colleagues uh, who, are, who are equally and better even able to support you uh, with some of your questions. So I'm not going to go through each of the following slides. I just want to make sure they're included 
in the video, um, I've put at the top of the slides the, you know, the courses that they're involved with. But just so you know, a lot of our courses have multiple instructors, professors. So although, by example, Rick Kravitz um, is the lead professor, uh, we say convening or organizing the Intro to Risk Management course, uh, he may have three, four, in, for my courses, international tax, eight or nine other instructors who are involved throughout the weekly case studies, through discussions, through pre recorded videos. Um, because, you know, no one person is an expert, is an expert in every area of that topic. And so we try as best as possible to bring in hyper specific experts. Um, so, you know, let's just say intro to risk management, if it were to cover, you know, six primary topic areas, uh, Rick might bring in or have pre recorded lectures, you know, from four or five different faculty, each one being an expert in a particular topic area, other than obviously he's an expert in several topic areas um, for that. And again, in my international tax courses, I may have you know, two, three experts on one topic area because they're two or three very different perspectives and uh, that I want brought to the table. Some of them may be pre-recorded, some of them um, or all of them may be live for one week, you know, leading or involved in a case study. Uh, Melissa Muhammad, she teaches in three different courses. She's uh, brilliant, um, been teaching in my former programs. Uh, she's one of my superstars uh, that I consider a like you know personal like boy you know, I could have traded my career for yours and uh, so she teaches in international tax risk management but she also teaches in FACA uh, uh, common reporting standards course and she also teaches in the U.S. tax risk management course. If you just look at her background, uh, you know currently you know and, and previously she's worked for um, large business and international at the IRS and top of authority, but Melissa you know also um, served for the Japanese tax authority and, and learned Jap you know, Japanese and speaks Japanese fluently. Um, she spent uh, you know, years over in Japan as a liaison for US Treasury. And then she's also spent, by example, uh, years, at least two years at the OECD living in Paris where she learned French and, uh, and so forth. Melissa's traveled all over the world working with US Treasury and um, in dealing with not just you know international tax issues but international tax risk because she's part of the competent authority and competent authority deals with you know what happened after the problems occurred so uh, you know really amazing uh, experiences that she's had with you know countries all over the world multicultural experiences that she brings that flavor those experiences to her real life case studies that she'll be leading you on if you're in the international tax courses. To say another word, we also blend faculty across disciplines. So some of our international tax faculty may be teaching in risk, may be teaching in wealth and vice versa. Um, our next uh, faculty, I'll, I'll throw him out there, is another superstar. Alan Brill um, has been teaching it a little, since, since uh, 1990. I want to say 1999, maybe it was the year 2000 was the first time. Um, he's colleagues with Bob Monroe. And, uh, and so cybersecurity was just, you know, coming up at that time as a real area, but, you know, information security has been around for, for decades. And in our, you know, anti-money laundering compliance type courses, uh, Alan Brill, both in person, in residence for our conferences and online, uh, has been leading um, courses such as, as you see on this on the slide, cybersecurity and info security. Now, Alan's senior managing director at Kroll, and for those of you in the risk business, you know who Kroll is. And, uh, and I, you know, encourage you for those now. Alan, you know, seven days a week, he's with clients, and his clients include you know governments and you know military operations, military like that. Uh, in NATO, so IGOs, intergovernmental military organizations. Um, but even though, uh, you know, he's one of the most, if not the most uh, sought after guru, if you will, on the subject matter, always on TV, he still finds his time to teach our courses, to spend time with the students, 
and to invite his colleagues from Quo and other disciplines or other firms into his forces um, to help lead the way. Um, I'll just look at a few more slides and scroll through the rest. You know, with legal risk management, which is a really unique course, we have my former colleague, uh, Christopher Gazillion, who's now at Texas State Business School. Uh, and he created that course with Matthew Whaley, uh, who's now Director of Legal Risk at Ernst & Young, formerly Director of Legal Risk at HSBC. Um, they wrote a book, obviously, has the Legal Risk Management Handbook that you see on the slide. Um, but where Chris and I used to teach this course in different variations, you know, residentially, his course, you invite me in to co-lecture with him. We moved the course online many years ago, and, uh, and, and Chris has done a bang-up job of making a totally unique contrarian course that after this course, you know, after lawyers go through this course, they're like, wow, I wish, I wish in, you know, when I was in law school 20 years ago, 10 years ago, they'd had a course like this. It would have really changed the way I approached some problem solving. Uh, for the non-lawyers, of course, you know, where law may be a new experience, it's still problem solving. And in our jobs, whether we're a lawyer, an accountant, a legal risk officer, a wealth manager, we're solving problems all the time. So that course really brings a, a different contrarian approach to, to problem solving. And uh, we have academics on our program. Uh, professor, also Dr. Maji uh, Christine Ray. Maji Ray is the Director of International Affairs and a professor at Waseda University, Japan's top university, you know, referred to as the Yale of Japan. I'm sure Waseda refers to Yale as the Waseda of the United States, but, uh, but uh, Maji has been involved with this program also 20 years. And uh, since our, um, I think since before our Miami days, but uh, at least since the Miami days, and uh, she graduated from this program. Uh, her second doctorate, I was on that panel for her uh, doctorate on transfer pricing and secret comparables. And, um, and she stuck with the program and she uh, teaches within it and is uh, in charge, you know, really you know, helps with uh, students with understanding Asian mindset. She's a um, I guess tri-national. Uh, she's Korean and Japanese by birth. You know, she's a dual um, birth nationality, I guess, if you say her mother, father, and uh, brought up in the United States. So she really has this, uh, you know, multicultural perspective on problem solving. And she's not just a tax, tax, tax person, not just a law person, you know, but she really you know, has a linguistics background as well. Uh, with languages. She has liberal arts background. Uh, she also teaches liberal arts. So she brings a lot of different perspectives and problem solving skills to our different areas in this program. And so I'll just flip through the rest of the slides, just making a, uh, you know, a comment or two on each. But, you know, we have Dr. Uh, Amos Guerra, you know, guru on the counterterrorism risk management. I encourage you to go look at his profile and, uh, and, um, Dr. Bridget Molman, uh, who is, uh, for those of you in international tax, you'll know her from the International Fiscal Association board membership. Uh, but she's really an academic leader for tax and technology. And her work you know, is really groundbreaking um, in terms of tax risk uh, for technology-enabled solving, or at least remediation, if, you know, if not full mitigation of tax risk. And risk can never be fully mitigated, of course. That's the, the, it's a process that is really constantly occurring. The risk is constantly occurring, constantly changing. Risk unfolds over time. Bridget's at the forefront of working um, on those type of issues, especially the technology-enabled uh, AI uh, machine learning um, programs to address, you know, to address problems in the future that, uh, that you know, aren't yet problems. Dr. Susanna Okobo, uh, who's just stepped down as uh, head of tax policy at Repsol, the Spanish oil company. So she brings, you know, skill sets of oil and gas industry, but she's a full professor at the Universidad Europea. Um, she's also former president of the uh, Commission on Inter for the International uh, Chamber of Commerce. She sits on the United Nations International Tax Committee, uh, very involved with that. 
Uh, she brings, um, she's, you know, Spanish fluent, she's Spanish nationality, but because in her role at Repsol, uh, you know, involved in you know, 80, 80 plus countries, uh, she brings a, again, a multicultural tax skill set to the table um, to both, you know, problem solve and to understand risk and mitigate risk, especially with technology enabled um, solutions in the future. And let's talk about wealth management. Uh, Dr. George Mintz has been involved with this program uh, since 1998, so that's over 20 years. Uh, he's a you know, really a pioneer in the wealth management industry, both for training, for certifications, designations, um, and, and books, authorship, and so forth. Uh, if you're in our live sessions, I'll, I'll tell you my story that uh, last year when I was sitting at the United Nations International Tax Committee, the Mexican representative uh, to the committee, uh, you know, so we're sitting around the table, I'll tell you, and you're sitting around the table, what book most influenced your, uh, your economic thinking? Um, we didn't want to talk about tax, that'd be boring. <laughs> we talked about tax all day. So we're sitting at the dinner table, let's see a book, and I, you know, and you know, get the typical, like, you know, I read you know, Anne Rand, or you know, I read, uh, um, you know, George Orwell, or whatever, you know, so everyone throws up their offer. The Mexican representative said, uh, you know, George Mintz's book, and I forget which one of his books, but the title is George Mintz's book. And I said, George Mintz? And I was, I was like, are you serious, George? And he's like, yeah, you know, he's a really you know, famous guy. And he's, you know, he's, you know, but the, he, he was talking the way that, you know, he's long dead. You know, he, he, was, he was using these, you know, past tense statements. It's like, no, no, George is alive. George teaches in our program. George is, is quite well. I, I saw him recently. And uh, and it started a conversation. I didn't even realize how you know, influential George's uh, authorship had become. And uh, anyway, so I, you know, I was more impressed by my by my by a faculty member, but uh, um, and thankful for it. But uh, George was uh, this maybe two years ago appointed to the commissioner the commissioner of the Presidential Scholars Program. And I think, which is just you know evidence his his, uh, his impact on on education in general. Dr. Bob Monroe. Been involved in this program since it started in the United States, version 1998. Co-author of several treatises with me with Alexis Nexus. You know, retired now from 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 Florida, but you know, I was co-director uh, with him and Fletcher Baldwin, who passed this year, unfortunately. Um, you know, they really they had the first center for studying international financial crimes. They were the pioneers in this industry um, on mitigation, remediation detection and so forth. And so with Bob, you know, you have one of the, well, really the, the person who's still alive, who's, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, really honing in on these issues before other people talked about it. Of course, when 9-11 came, then it became, you know, an issue of discussion like COVID today with pandemics. Um, but Bob is, you know, brings the history and then Bob in his course brings, you know, current people working on AI solutions, on technology, software, and so forth, and the banking system, because he specifically focuses on money laundering and bank secrecy act in, in the U.S. people, but uh, you know, in financial crime prevention. Back to international tax, you know, we we really have the top people at you know big firms, big four, um, like Nelu, who is a professor for for other schools, but she's the international managing director, and Nelu is just again, she's you know. She, she is one of the gurus in addressing tax risk. And she is, you know, willing to find the time to teach half with Melissa Muhammad, who I already introduced, um, the international US tax uh, risk course and, and reporting. So whereas Melissa brings up, you know, obviously a government perspective, because she's been, as I call it, a lifer. She's for her entire life worked for government and, and governmental authorities like the OECD. Uh, Nelu brings the uh, the client perspective, if you will, um, uh, having worked for the big four and continues to work for the big four. Uh, we have, you know, judiciary, if you, if you will, or, or decision makers, or problem, you know, the, the arbitrators. And uh, Judge Wallace, who was a former insurance fraud prosecutor, former general counsel, U.S. Lloyds. Um, 
as you know, teaching insurance law and really the risks, you know, the problems of insurance law, what goes wrong. And uh, so many of the students in this program, you know, you have 10, 20 years, I was in this, somebody's applying for the program and say, well, I have 20, 25 years. I say, well, you know, a lot of the other students in the program also have 20 or 25 years. So no, you don't want to take a basic insurance law course. You want to take the advanced, you know, the risks, everything that goes wrong <laughs> with insurance law and more relevant, how do you deal with it? You know, how do I, how do I uh, manage the risk? And when the risk materializes, you know, how do I remediate it? And, uh, and, and so Judge Wallace has that uh, burden, if you will, and he loves teaching for us. He teaches residentially at the law school and online um, for our graduate program. But we have, uh, you know, again, Dr. George Salas, who is again a pioneer for tax, trade, um, both indirect and direct tax, combining these two, uh, uh, these two, uh, areas and from a technology enabled um, approach, uh, especially for econometrics, you know, so big data, um, you know, hands down, George, Min uh, sorry, uh, George Salas is, you know, considered by, is considered by the industry to be a leader. He's the principal economist in Vertex, but he's also, you know, a lawyer. Um, he also has financial background. He was also an educator when I met George, who's been involved in this program also since 1998, when I met George, uh, he was dean at another institution, at a liberal arts college in, uh, in, in Florida. And uh, he'd gone, he'd been working went to academia, had his PhD, got a second PhD, and then went back into, um, went back into practice and uh, after serving his deanship. And uh, we have, you know, from our own institution, um, so we have several professors, both at the main campus uh, and at the law school involved in this program, Dr. Paula DeVitt, who, who serves in different courses uh, for different purposes in my graduate program, but also in, in other courses in the law school. So she created from scratch a course on enterprise risk analytics. I said, I don't want, you know, a copycat course of what some other institutions do. We're going to approach this from scratch. In fact, do not look at the syllabus of any other institution. Let's talk to industry and what does industry need, and let's build out based on that. And that's what um, Paula did, and, and it's just brilliant. Of course, we get favorable feedback, but our, we don't sit on our laurels here at Texas A and M. It was great last year. We keep reinventing every year. We're improving, reinventing, taking the feedback from the students who have experience in the industry and calibrating for the next year's course. So we, we like to think we get it better all the time. You know, the joke for lawyers is why are we always practicing? Because we hope to get it right someday. Um, so Paula, who's, a, as you can see, at the engineering school, an engineer, mathematics person, computer science, is also a lawyer, is also an educator, master of education from Purdue. Um, she's not a tax person. And she's involved in our tax program because our tax program is multidisciplinary. And so when we look at risk, we look at risk from different perspectives. And I don't think that the answer for tax, you know, people in tax, we've become so myopic with our code and our regulations and our decisions and our, you know, private letter rulings, you know, all those stuff that we talk about in tax you know, regarding whatever country you know, has different name, but the same practice notes in the United Kingdom. We've become so myopic that we forget that there are other disciplines out there that can help us problem solve uh, for the future. So Paula brings, by example, for our international tax risk management, she says, I don't need to know tax to understand risk management. And, uh, but with my risk management, I can take what you do in tax, tax is numbers, I'm a mathematician, tax is processes, I'm an engineer, and perhaps from what we do in my worlds, our worlds, I can help y'all think about your world in tax and we can come up with solutions. So in our program, you'll notice in our classes, it's not just about teaching what's been done in the past or what's been done currently. It's about thinking about the future, which means that you, the students working on teams, moderated and guided, coordinated by our professors, are coming up with solutions for the future. You're, you're writing actually the thought provoking papers, hopefully articles that we can publish uh, going forward. 
So, you know, okay, now I'll flip through the slides quickly, but we have our own law professors like Neil Newman, my colleague, a lot of CPA attorneys, you know, involved with our securities risk and our tax program. Um, my personal, you know, co-teaching colleague, uh, Dr. Lorraine Eden, who is a guru of transfer pricing, number one guru. She's, she's the be all end all. And I uh, really look up to her. And I thought I knew a lot of people in transfer pricing, thought I knew a lot about it. Okay, I knew George, George Salas, so he knows more than me. And then I met Lorraine Eden, and she knows more than both of us combined. She's really the, the be all. And, uh, and so she, you know, retired, and she still, you know, she loves the subject matter so much that she's willing to stay involved with our program. She, you know, she shows up in uh, different lectures and uh, really, you know, engages and, and provides us insights that just, you know, only a rank can do. She's really so respected by the industry. We're lucky that she, you know, remains involved. And, you know, she retired from Mays Business School where she remains emeritus, but she's also full at our, at our law school as well. So uh, Gary Lucas, my colleague, um, he's the smarter of the two of us, but uh, you know, we both teach federal income tax, or what we call affectionately baby tax at, at the JD program. Um, but Gary worked in the you know, medium-sized small business world, and he brings, whereas I worked at multinational level because I do transfer pricing as my, really my forte, my, my academic background, you know, Gary brings that wealth perspective of the small business, the entrepreneur, you know, the person who starts, you know, with a bootstrap and all of a sudden has a hundred million dollars, that's Gary's work. And uh, so, you know, Gary brings that taxation and business associations uh, expertise to our program, but you can change the word business associations and put investment fund. Uh, you, you know, you, that's, that's Gary's world. So, um, he, you know, you can t even though he's our dean of finance and administration and has a lot of, you know, let's say add on duties, uh, to his daily work life, he still manages to be involved with students and writing articles that are cutting edge in our, in our world of tax. And uh, oil, we have plenty of oil and gas teachers. We're in Texas. You should expect that. So Javiz, uh, who, I, who I met at the United Nations Subcommittee on International Tax, you know, spent a lifetime career advising governments, you know, working with the IMF, working with the um, HMRC, and you know, supporting private industry. Uh, he's the author, general editor of the United Nations Transfer Pricing Manual and of the United Nations Taxation and Extractive Industries Manual. Uh, you know, his, he continues to be involved with the United Nations uh, International Tax Subcommittee and you know, jetting around the world, even with COVID, uh, you know, visiting 80 countries a year, solving problems. Uh, for both clients and governments, you know, obviously extractive industries is where I know him from. He's, you know, well beyond extractive industries on supply chain, technology, digital taxation, and so forth, and not just taxation. Um, that, that's where I've met him, but, uh, but involved, you know, in operations and so forth. Really amazing background, and uh, we're lucky that he gives his time to this program. Farm Corrupt Practices Act with Professor Mike Kohler, um, Ben Turner, uh, who bootstrapped, you know, a, a you know, created from scratch an alternative risk transfer agency and built it into a, a eight figure agency and, uh, and and sold it and uh, and continues to be active in the industry um, with Einstein Financial Services. Uh, but he's a graduate of this program um, from a decade or so ago. And uh, so he is both the, you know, I was just like Maji Ray, like Dr. George Salas. I was a student in this program. Um, and I'm, you know, I became successful in the industry and I give back to the program through, through teaching, being involved with the students and so forth. Uh, Dr. Br uh, you know, we got Bruce Agaris, partner, Berlin and Cochrane and Rowe, but really, you know, the known guru on white collar crimes. Um, my colleague, uh, Professor Terry Helge, again, a CPA attorney on uh, fiduciary administration. She's another tax colleague at our law school, also the associate dean of, of academic affairs. And, uh, and again, okay, I'll flip through the slides, but you know, from different big firms, from different big four, um, internally within Texas A&M, from main campus involved with our wealth and our risk program. Um, colleagues of mine have been through this program, suffered through this program, um, 
from private industry, from the government, uh, my co-authors of mine in different books and articles like Robert Bloink, uh, Hayden Perriman, um, Ned Olson, another alumni of the program who continues to be actively involved. And, uh, and he reminded me the other day, I'm not yet retired. Uh, he's had a very long, esteemed career, well over 35 years. He's gone for 40 years, 45 years now in tax and really, you know, groundbreaking author. You know, he's the guy who runs a PhD in tax risk and another oil and gas expert. David Deputy, who is, who is head of the, uh, I don't call it lobbying anymore, Government Relations uh, Association. Uh, for industry, for AI, uh, and for blockchain uh, here in the United States, uh, you know, constantly with the, you know, interacting with OECD and other IGOs on behalf of industry, but he's uh, head of, you know, director of strategic development and emerging markets for Vertex. And so that's where our faculty is, but let's talk about student and former student networks. So you have a network of our faculty. I, I showed you, you know, the iceberg top. We have many more involved with this program um, who will come in for one or two lectures during your, during your time uh, through a curriculum. But, uh, but also students learn from students and students learn from former students. We don't call it alumni here at Texas A&M, if you don't know that, or right, former students. So it's the Association of Former Students, and it's over 500,000 former students strong, over 254, as you see, Aggie clubs uh, worldwide. There's an Aggie near you, wherever you are. Now, if you're in the United States, there's gonna be a lot more Aggies than if you're in Australia. But there are Aggies in Australia, the Middle East, uh, Asia, South America, as you see on the screen. These are all uh, where Aggie clubs are located. You'll learn in the program about being 12th man. We actually use the 12th man term uh, now, actually, the students started me to use the 12th man term in our student team. So if we have, like, by example, 11 students, and so we have, in theory, you should have four terms of four teams of three, but one team only has two. Somebody serves as the 12th man and has to pinch hit uh, for two teams that week. And, and uh, but 12th man is a, as a nostalgia here at Texas A&M about public service and so forth. You'll learn about that while you're in the program. I also try and connect students through LinkedIn. So I encourage you to join my student alumni mentoring group um, on LinkedIn, as you see on the slide before you. But uh, you don't have to, it's not required. Uh, you know, privacy, FERPA compliance and all that. This is not a Texas A&M group. This is outside of the context of Texas A&M. So if you elect to join, um, you know, it's the privacy rights that LinkedIn gives you. But uh, in LinkedIn, I think six or 700 um, active uh, former students of mine. Uh, and if you, know, if you drop out of the group, if you don't want to be uh, active anymore, but you know, it's for people who want to mentor, connect with each other. So uh, it's not the only way. You know, I encourage you to use your Aggie um club groups but the aggie club you'll connect across the entire university this is for people specifically who have been involved in the tax the wealth the risk and so on uh curricula uh curriculum of of, of my programs in the past uh, with your aggie clubs you'll connect with people in the engineering school in the business school in the law school and so forth across many years well five hundred thousand people that's plenty of people to connect with i maybe have I don't know, two, 3,000 former students in my programs. Let's talk about the approach. Now, I keep talking about team-based or case study-based. So we start with flip the classroom. And here at Texas A&M, we have, a, you know, like all schools nowadays, we have an electronic campus. I say nowadays because in 1994, when I pioneered online education, I had to build all this kind of stuff from scratch. And I literally mean learn coding and build it from scratch using bulletin board. And if you remember back then, for those of you older, ICQ chat and, and so forth. So, okay, today we have Blackboard and we're moving as a fall into Canvas, all state schools in Canvas in, 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 in the state of Texas are. A Canvas, Blackboard, you know, whatever you want to call your system, they're more or less the same functionality. 
I don't favor one over another, but you access it through your Texas A&M campus portal, which means that by this time you already have your uh, university identification number, which we call a UIN. So we house the videos, the discussion forums, um, they're just pre-recorded videos, discussion forums, uh, you know, your, your, you know, what team am I in, Excel spread, you name it, materials, books, you know, it's housed here in the eCampus. So this is a, you know, example of a, a Blackboard version for right now because we don't have Canvas set up yet. And when you start every course, I, I inform the teachers, I can't make them do it. We have, you know, the, the, we have full academic freedom here at Texas a and but I encourage all teachers to have a social biography um, form to start their course. And for you to go in, I'm not gonna talk about social biographies today, but you know, you to go in and, and just follow the instructions and do it, every single course. Well, I don't have to repeat, no, copy and paste it. You know, copy and paste your social bio biography, semester to semester, term to term, but do it because you're gonna find that the networking opportunities expand the more input you put into your social biography. And uh, so, okay, I won't talk about it anymore, I'm just, uh, just do it. And our learning method has, it's, it's a flip the classroom because you have pre-recorded videos for all your courses, pre-recorded podcasts and audios and all this, but then you have your active learning, your, your case studies, your team-based synchronous, real-time, Zoom-based, uh, case studies where you're, so this is an example of our Zoom. Yes, I have her to sign off from all my students. It's okay uh, to see their, their faces and names. This is an example of a team and we're leading. Um, it's 8 a.m. in the morning. That's when we have to do um, a lot of our courses because it's before work, but it's also because we have international students in China and Indonesia, overseas. And so for them, it's 8, 9, 10 at night. And uh, and so, uh, and so for those of you who have seen me in class before, or you will see me, I'll be dressed in my, uh, my Texas A&M PJs, as I call them, my Texas A&M clothes. And, uh, and uh, so we have our teams working through our case study, and we have, uh, I don't think I have one of these slides this time, but we have slides, we, have, we can have, you know, we, our, our sections are limited to 30 people, so we don't ever have more than 30 people involved in, in, in one course. If we have 60 people signed up, we have two sections. If we have 50 people, we have two sections of 25. So you never have more than 30, 35, you know, with lectures, 35 uh, uh, videos on the screen. But you know, I've been in video conferences on Zoom for faculty meetings or for actual conferences, you know, with 49 video screens. And it works, you know, we, as long as you have a very good online professor, instructor who understands moderation using Zoom, uh, it all works out fine. People need to know when to you know, turn their mics on and off. Okay, so using Zoom, which every student in our program has a Zoom account. Uh, if you if you're a new student, you'll using your UIN, you'll you'll go in, sign up for your Zoom account. You can use it for all your academic purposes to create your own Zoom live sessions and so forth. But each course, I do have a I do actually have. This is a faculty meeting at Texas A&M, um, so we have you know two screens like this, 49 each, and uh, and uh, and in our Zoom meetings, uh, you know we manage to have great discussions, good debates, and so I know people who are hesitant because I've never done online education before, and I've certainly never done it synchronously. It works great. I've been doing it for a long time, for decades, literally, and you know and it gets better gets better over time, bandwidth gets better, technology gets better. Um, I learn new skills and tricks of the trade uh, and, and so on. So it passes on to our faculty. So, uh, so you're really gonna like the interactive, discussive nature of our, of our courses, but you only get out what you put in. So if you're, if you're you know, silent in your residential courses back when you were in school, you're gonna be, you know, don't be silent in your Zoom courses. Don't scream and be loud, but you know, be be attentive, be involved, be engaged. And if you know what what's no fun for the professor is when they show up and you have your six or seven students for the team or whatever, and they're just silent. And the professor's like, 
So what do y'all think? And there's just silence. Nobody raises their hand. Nobody turns on their microphone. When you turn on your microphone, your, your screen turns yellow on the, on the Zoom. And, and the professor's like, okay, so then the professor says, okay, so, uh, um, so Charlotte, uh, you know, I see you're here. What do you think? And then Charlotte's like, I don't have an opinion. <laughs> you know, that, that's no fun. You know, so come engage, come prepare, do your pre recordings. And it'll make it a lot of fun. And then, you know, as we get to know each other, uh, course by course, you know, you have a lot of chattiness, a lot of um, uh, back and forth. The moderator, by you know, by the midpoint of the course, the moderator, the faculty member knows the students and you know, and says, okay, so Miss Smith, um, Mr. Jones, you know, says that uh, you really don't know what you're talking about. You want to defend yourself? Okay, Mr. Jones, Ms. Smith, she's you know convinced me, so I don't you know I don't I don't, I don't support your side anymore. You want to double you know you want to re uh, re engage in this you know so it becomes chatty. We have a lot of banter back and forth, a lot of jokes, and uh, and uh, we do our best to record the sessions for those who can't come. The recordings don't always work. Um, our teachers forget, so you know come and be prepared, you know, and, and then be involved and be engaged. And if you really, you know, you aren't going to make a session, that's okay. You know, I've got clients, I've got work, I've got family issues. Inform your professor so they're not waiting. You know, the little, let's wait another two minutes to see if so-and-so shows up. Because they know all y'all by name. We keep, we're, we don't run MOOCs. We run small sections so that the teacher does know who you are and you know who everyone else is. Which means that they're waiting for you to show up. So inform them beforehand that you're, you're not coming and, uh, and then, you know, so to also make sure that they record the session for you, and or at least try to record the session. We, we have, you know, there's a lot of documentation and in our, you know, whether we keep it, you know, some of them are pretty heavy, like, you know, recorded sessions, as I mentioned. So thick, you know, recorded videos can be, you know, hundreds of megabytes <laughs> and gigabyte. And so we'll keep those on, you know, Generally on Google Drive, you know, associated with our our, our Texas A&M system. So as as with Texas A&M UIN, you get a Texas A&M email address, and your Texas A&M email address is actually, even though it says tamu.edu, is is managed by Google. And with Google, you have all the Google applications and support with education. So you'll have your own Google Drive and, and so forth associated with Texas A&M. You don't have to use it. But you have it's part of the part of the package, if you will. Uh, you have, if not the most, you know, one of the most robust libraries of a university system. Okay, if you're at Harvard or Yale, you're saying my library is better, <laughs> but we're we're up there. We're in the top ten for library spends. So we have a university library and a law library. This isn't a library orientation, but I just show off some of the some of the things. I, first of all, we have two of them, so you have to you know have to know to access through the two different screens. And if you download this PowerPoint, um, these these are linked, so you can just. But I, I Google I Google T A M U Texas A M University T A M U Library or T A M U Law Library. And that's how I I find them every time. And I should just say my favorites, but I never have. And using your credentials, you'll find that like in the law library, um, through our proxy, tax analysts, IBFD, we have hundreds of databases in the law library. I'm just pointing out the ones that I typically use as a tax person. Um, CHEDA, which is formerly uh, CCH, and Teleconnect Clure, Clure Materials. The university library, the kind of you know, databases we use regularly in our, in our risk and our uh, transfer pricing courses, Fitch, Connect, Bureau of Indict, OECD, Checkpoint, S&P CAP, S&P, um, you know, the McGraw-Hill financial materials, Thomson Reuters, and so on. Um, but again, they have thousands, thousands, literally thousands of databases on the university library um, that you'll leverage, not all thousand, you'll leverage some of them, like you'll certainly, if you're in my courses, you'll be leveraging the ones you see on the screen. And, uh, if you're in risk management, um, you know, with the university library, we have, you know, a risk management reference center. That is a unique database, one of a thousand databases we have, um, or another database we have is called risk abstracts. 
Um, so, you know, for those of you taking the risk courses, you'll obviously be using these databases. And these databases have sub-databases within them. So we're not just a program that is based on what you hear from the professor or the books that the professor's written or, or what have you. We're a deep academic program, you know, that gives you the ability to research in the area that we're talking about from paid proprietary publishers. And uh, so it's not, yes, let's go see what Wikipedia sees, you know, what is the latest blog article from, you know, who knows who curated, qualified it, so much fake news, fake this, fake that nowadays. Um, you know, so we're giving you the resources that you need um, to be able to do the proper research um, outside of your class time. And we, you know, it's all proxy based. But for those of you who are, it's easy to set up the VPN. I have a separate orientation on, on setting up the VPN, but literally it's so you know, point click easy. It still takes you five to 10 minutes, but it's well, well spent five to 10 minutes. With the VPN access, um, you have some better added functionality. And it's not the old days of VPN where the VPN slowed your computer up, ate all your bandwidth. This is the new days of VPN. We have great VPN. So I, I don't notice any slowness, any latency. Um, and I do notice some added functionality when I use my VPN. I can, and be, because it's the new days of VPN, I could turn it off and turn it back on. Really not a big deal to tunnel directly into your university um, system and, and, and use the university databases and so on from within the university, regardless of where you are. Um, I've been in China in VPN, then, so I know the VPN works. Um, of course, if you're a lawyer, you know about Lexis, Westlaw, Bloomberg Law, and so on. You have your Lexis, Westlaw, Bloomberg, and so if you know what those are, um, you'll you have access to those accounts. You have it through your library subscription, but you can get your direct access. Um, those of you in, 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 in the tax program, you're obviously using Lexis because my books are on Lexis, um, but we have the Bloomberg Law and so on. So I encourage you, if you are orienting for the first time and you're not a lawyer, and so I don't really know what Bloomberg Law, you know, I've used Bloomberg or Terminal, but what's Bloomberg Law? Um, yeah, it's the other part of Bloomberg's empire. Um, so I encourage you to you know, activate it and to explore. Our electronic resources librarian will automatically send you, at the beginning of every term, you're gonna get an email from the law library, from Joan Stringfellow, who's a professor of librarian um, services. She's head of technical and electronic services. She's gonna send you an email that says, you know, these are electronic services of Texas A&M library. I encourage you to sign up for them. And it's gonna take you step by step how to do that. She's gonna send you uh, reminders to do it. When you have a problem, oh, my Lexus account, I forgot how to use it. Do not contact Joan. She's not the right party. She, she's the big picture organizer, but you know, every database has its own IT support. 24 seven, 365, Lexus, Bloomberg, Westlaw, and so on. However, Texas A&M Library and Law Library both have uh, reference desks. So you'll remember the days when you actually walked into a library and you went and talked to the librarians at the desk. And okay, we have that online nowadays. You would chat, phone call, video call, Zoom call, whatever you want to call it, email them. They're there to support you. And that's a totally separately staffed desk by professional librarians who manage, you know, librarians in training. Like, you know, we have a library college at Texas A&M who actually trains all of so a full college of mass, you know, anyway, but, but we have law students who work the reference desk and so on have been trained at this. So if you have library questions like, well, I, I don't know where to, how to find a resource or where a resource is or ask your reference library. So I go to my TAMU law uh, webpage and I'll, and I'll see reference desk. Now let's look at some of our Texas A&M administration in our final like five minutes of this orientation. Starting with our president, Michael Young. <laughs> so Dr. Michael Young started at law school. He was for 25 years, you know, a law professor and dean uh, at a law school. Um, 
And then he became, uh, and then he decided he wanted to join university administration. He became president at one university, moved to another university, and finally, he's, his, his final position, let's hope, is here at Texas A&M. He manages $6.3 billion budget. We're the largest U.S. public university. We're only one of 60 that's accredited by the, uh, by the American Association of Universities, which means that we're at the very top of the STEM academic game. Uh, we're only one of 17 U.S. universities that holds triple U.S. federal designation of land, sea, and space. And we're only one of six senior military colleges. And this past year, we finally broke the top 20 rankings as a university. So the important ranking for universities, for U.S. News and World Report for us law schools, but for universities, we look at the Wall Street Journal, Times Higher Education, and Texas A&M is now in the top 20. And you, and you say, but I, I always thought Texas A&M was in the top 20. You have to remember, Texas A&M was only a military college until the 19th, uh, until like 1970, the uh, late 60s, only military college. It wasn't, it didn't, you weren't allowed to go if you weren't in the military. So it's only in the last 50 years, 50, uh, 60, <laughs> the last 60 years now that Texas A&M, you know, has, has had non-military attendees and so it's you know it's had some catch up in terms of the ranking system um, but uh, but we've caught up here we are our law school is led by uh, who uh, uh, by nickname Bobby but uh, by Dean Robert uh, Adia and uh, again we all call him Bobby I think he, I think he's okay with that and um, but uh, under his supervision we're now at number 60. Remember, six years ago, there was no Texas A&M Law School. This is the fastest rise in ranking of any institution um, in the U.S. News World history. Uh, so we'll be first year um, uh, soon, but you know it's it's a year by year process. So it's going to be a couple of years, but uh, but we're certainly on the rise. As you can see, unemployment. Uh, sorry, unemployment. Maybe with COVID, unemployment. Um, but employment, we're punching almost ninety five percent now. These, you know, these are really high statistics, bar passage over 90%. Um, and, uh, and, you know, rubber meets the road. This is the year rubber meets the road. We're doing what we're supposed to do. We're all working hard, but this is the COVID year. And let's see how, you know, are, do we really have the sustainability? It's tough for everyone out there, students and faculty alike. And, I, you know, Bobby, Bobby's an amazing leader, uh, full of energy, full of ideas, you know, able to herd, the sheep, if you will, you know, we all want to wander and do our thing, and you know, we've got to keep us in the same corral, you know, so, you know, to keep us on the same bus, or for those of you from New York, on the same subway, and, uh, and you know, and so Bobby has, a, he's an amazing academic, but he's, you know, an amazing leader, keeping us all on the same path, and with our remaining minutes, let's just look at our administrators in the program to put a face to a name, as I promised. So David Dye, amazing leader for the graduate program. So he comes from Oklahoma, Whereas you have somebody like me, I've been involved for a very long time with online and all that, but you know, I, I write, I, I like to think, I think I'm the number one writer in the United States in terms of law. I you know, do a couple hundred articles a year and for media. I have 10 treatises with 24 supplements each year and on you know, chapters and yada, yada. So I'm writing a lot. And uh, whereas David Dye has been focused on sustainable, scalable graduate education, and in particular in the online world. And, uh, and so he brings the ability for us to have a program that's larger than 60 or 70 students. We're actually at 160 or 170 now. By the time we reach fall, I bet we're gonna be at 200 enrolled students. We're starting to reach capacity at that point, I believe. But David says, it's just because you're a small thinker, Burns. <laughs> you know, you gotta, he, he's managed programs that he has built to 350, 400 enrolled students in quality, high quality programs. So I really look forward to being able to scale what we do in my world. You know, I've been managing groups of 20 and 30 that, you know, he can bring to manage groups of 50, 60s and 70s. Our classes, our sections will still be 25, 30s. Don't worry, we're not mooking out. Um, he's just that good at, uh, at administering and his assistant um, Alyssa, who's our coordinator, uh, 
now she's amazing. She always gets back same day. I don't know how she always gets it because we're now at 150, 160 active students plus alumni. Um, we just have amazing people at Texas A&M. That's what I can say. Thank God for them. Um, or I, I would not be able to do what I do. Our registrar team, uh, so this is faces to name, left to right. Uh, they're there to help you through the process to get started and to restart each term. Um, everything is obviously, like all schools, done electronically with your howdy. Um, we don't just say howdy, you know, to start a class, but as you see the picture behind them, we have the howdy wall and the howdy electronic system for students. And uh, so they're here to support you and, uh, and they, you, know, you can email them. Now you can't call them right now. With COVID, I think we reopened on July 1st is the governor's order. Um, but we'll have, you know, they're back in the office, but it's like, you know, 25% occupancy. So only one of the four, then it'll become 50% and so on. But, uh, but they're very responsive by email. Everybody's working from home. Um, for the faculty members who are watching this right now, your contacts are shall um, for your instructional design and your separate faculty orientation. So watch that one also. And Megan Murphy, uh, who graduated from AM. Um, so she's, a, she's an Aggie uh, from Maine campus. And now she uh, lives in Fort Worth, uh, working at the law school, supporting you as a faculty member, uh, supporting you for HR and so forth. So there's Megan's uh, you know, face to a name, to an email address. And finally, for all online programs, last slide, I need IT help. I need IT support. I need IT. 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I have called this IT office at 3 in the morning, many a morning, because I write all night. Um, but I also do it just to test them out. If I'm up at 2 in the morning, I have speed dial. I'll call the IT office and I just say, howdy. I just wanted to see if anybody was there. Thank you for answering my call. Seriously, I do that. Um, don't everybody do that before they come out. Let me get all right. Guy, Guy Burns keeps calling us. Um, but uh, but uh, this is these are real Aggies. This is not outsourced. This is not like, oh, I'm calling a foreign country at 3. No, these are real Aggies. They support the largest public university in the United States, 70 plus thousand students on, and yet they're able to get back to you same day. You need your UIN though. They don't know you by name. They plug your UIN into the computer and that's how they pull up your profile. They can take over your screen. They can fix things. They, you know, they, so go to the IT support um, desk, you know, desk, the web page, and you'll find a lot of answers before you, you need to contact them but you can contact them and they you know, have just like a, you know, Dell computers. <laughs> they have tier one support, tier two, tier three, and, uh, and, but they solve problems. They have solved some really tough problems for me, like software, config, um, conflicts, because I use a lot of softwares <laughs> that conflict with each other. I'm using you know, Apple one day for something and da da da. Yeah, and my Dell and I said, you know, it's just, I, you know, I'm an, I'm an online pioneer and just have to keep pushing the envelope, right? They have stuck with it where they keep contact, you know, over a weekend trying to solve a problem, contacting me saying, you know, what about this? What about that? What about this? And I'm like, and I'm like this, I, you know, I go back, you know, I think this problem is literally unsolvable. I got to kind of contact the software manufacturers. However, you know, you've given me a lot of good ideas. Thank you for your support. Um, they're there from your base. I forgot my password to, I don't know how to set up the VPN to my Zoom account's not working. That shouldn't happen, but regardless, they're there for that. So, uh, so I, I have talked to their director and I have seen their, their facilities. They have an entire building, like real Aggie building, entire floor to servicing um, IT support. So don't be afraid. Uh, to enter this program and feel, but how am I going to get my support at two in the morning? Because I worked all day. They're there for you. When you have questions, email the appropriate administrator. When you have academic questions that deal with you and your career, contact me and let's Zoom. But when you have academic questions like I need my transcript or I need a signature and all that, you can email me with the but you're just creating another you know, step in your cycle because I'm going to have to email you back and say, well, the, you know, I, I think the right person for you to talk to is da da da. So, so watch your orientation videos. I make each term um, 
you know, keep up to date with your administrators, use your Texas A&M website, the search function, and, uh, and then again, for your academic questions, uh, you know, how does this work for me? I want to set up my curriculum for me. I'm a banker and I do this. You know, what courses do you think? Can I, can I bend your ear, bounce the ideas off of what I think my curriculum should look like? Let's send together. Or send me an email and I'll give you email feedback um, as well. So I look forward. I'm glad you joined us. I look forward to engaging with you in your, in your program. Because uh, I, I come into a lot of courses, especially at the beginning of the semester, and just check in and see what's going on, spur some discussion. And, and if you're in my courses in particular, I look forward to getting you in on my teams and let's, and let's do some interesting you know, case studies together. And with that, thank you very kindly. And the final, uh, the final Texas A&M uh, giggle. Let's see what that means if you, when you're in the program.